Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Reform Rookie Video Podcast. It's good to have you with us this evening. Tonight, I have a special guest, Dr. Tony Costa. Uh, but before we start our discussion, I just want to let you know, if you want to learn about Reform Theology on a beginner level, please go to www.reformedrookie.com. On that website, you'll have access to the videos that we put up. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube uh, slash C slash Reform Rookie, we have about 150 or so videos about all different topic, topics, including the doctrines of grace. Um, we're going through a series on spiritual depression and Proverbs. Uh, we also uh, have a podcast that you can find on iTunes or Anchor, uh, Anchor Podcast. You just type it in, in online, uh, Reform Rookie. Uh, and we're going through a series on, Pastor Chris is going through a series on Leviticus, and it's, it's very, very good. So if you want to avail yourself to Reform Theology or learning a little bit more about it, please, again, go to reformrookie.com. You'll find the blog there. Then you can go to the YouTube channel or the podcast. Uh, and with that, I just want to introduce uh, a friend of ours, uh, our, our church and our ministry, and a, and a dear brother in Christ. This is Dr. Tony Costa, who's a professor at Toronto Baptist Seminary uh, in Canada. Uh, he's a dear friend to our, uh, our family at Hope Reform Baptist Church. Welcome, Dr. Tony. It's a pleasure to be with you, Anthony. Good to see you again. Um, so we had a debate set up on does, back, does water baptism save? And it was set up for October 31st, which is Reformation Day. And unfortunately, due to COVID, we had to postpone. Uh, we still don't have a date rescheduled. So what I wanted to do, uh, Dr. Tony, is bring you on, uh, discuss the different topics about baptism that probably would have been hit in the debate. Uh, and I sent you uh, an outline. I want to talk about baptismal re regeneration, you know, what that is, uh, then talk about infant baptism and believer's baptism. So sure. first, maybe we can go through who su supports each one of those views, maybe discuss some of the scriptures behind them, and then see what the early church fathers had to say about those views so that we sure. can come to some sort of understanding of yeah. what it is. So, so yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, go yeah, ahead. so start with baptismal regeneration. For the people who yeah. don't know anything about uh, not just Reformed theology, ju just theology in general, what is baptismal regeneration? Yeah, baptismal regeneration is the view that says that when someone is baptized, the act of baptism uh, regenerates the person. So that baptism, the act of baptism has the power to regenerate the person. Now, some people say, well, it's God who does it through the sacrament or God does it through the ordinance. But what it suggests is that baptism in and of itself, when it's utilized by the minister or a child or an adult, it brings about the effect of regeneration. And so Roman Catholics hold to this view. Uh, Lutherans, believe it or not, uh, at least we'll can talk a little bit more about this, but Luther, uh, post-1525, went in, in that direction very strongly. Mm -hmm. um, baptism regeneration is also held by the Eastern Orthodox Church okay. and basically all the churches of the East. So I'm talking about the Coptic Church and and uh, the Assyrian Orthodox Church, the Syriac Orthodox Church. And um, there is a doctrine in Rome Catholicism called ex opere operato, mm -hmm. which means out of the very work, the work is done. So mm -hmm. the very act of baptism brings about the regeneration of the child. Uh, most cases, it's the child. And they believe that the child becomes a child of God, going from a child of the flesh to become a child of God, through the process of baptism. Mm. So that actually would bring about the person's salvation, basically. Correct. So, so the priest or the minister uh, would baptize the child, and at that moment, that person would be, quote-unquote, born again. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and, and not just born again, but uh, in their view, uh, the child has all their sins uh, remitted. So original sin is wiped out by uh, baptism. And the child is believed to be uh, adopted into the family of God at that point. Mm -hmm. And the child grows in, in, in the so-called the graces, the sacraments that they have to go through. But this is no guarantee, at least in the Roman Catholic Church, there is no guarantee that your baptism or regeneration will guarantee that you'll be uh, saved at the end. Because Rome teaches that you can lose your salvation through, uh, through mortal sin. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. So wouldn't uh, also one is Pentecostals hold to that? Yeah, one is Pentecostals. The, the only difference is one is Pentecostals would say that, first of all, the baptismal formula is not Trinitarian. They don't believe right. that you baptize in the name of the Trinity God. They believe in baptism in the name of Jesus, or they call it the Jesus only movement. Mm -hmm. um, so they believe that unless you're not only baptized in water in the name of Jesus, but unless you speak in tongues as well, mm -hmm. you cannot be saved. So a one is Pentecostalism would hold to a view of baptism regeneration as well. Mm -hmm. So now I think obviously they're going to put forth some scriptures that would point to the fact that uh, like First uh, Peter 3.21, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. So doesn't that verse say that baptism is what saves you? Well, it doesn't really say that baptism actually saves you. The language is very important here because words mean what they mean in context. And so in 1 Peter 3.21, Peter uses the Greek word antitupon, which is our word uh, antitype. And so an antitype is something that represents something else by symbol. So the sacrifices of the Old Testament uh, in the book of Leviticus, and I'm, I, I'm sure Pastor Chris will mention this, but the sacrifices in the book of Leviticus are antitypes of the true uh, representation of Christ's atonement on the cross. Mm -hmm. and so the animal sacrifices, as the book of Hebrews points out, could never take away sin. It could never remove sin. It couldn't expiate sin. It could cover sin temporarily, but it pointed forward to that great sacrifice that the Lamb of God himself would take upon himself, and he would take away the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. So the animal sacrifices in and of themselves did not really uh, forgive their sin. It simply temporarily covered them, but they were uh, shadows, if you will, of the ultimate reality, just like the Sabbath was a shadow of the absolute rest and the complete rest that we have in the Lord Jesus. So what Peter says in, in 1 Peter 3.21, he's talking about the flood, and he talks about the days of Noah, and we need to understand that the waters of the flood uh, did two things. It destroyed the, un the uh, ungodly world, and it kept the ark afloat. It, it, it saved the family of Noah, while at the same time destroying the ungodly generation but it was god who put him in the ark and it was god who closed the ark mm -hmm. and the ark is a picture of jesus it's a it's an antitype of jesus because if you are in the ark you will be saved from the the the, the wrath of god the judgment of god mm -hmm. similarly if you're in christ you will be saved from the wrath of god so what peter is saying is that the waters of the flood uh corresponds to baptism as an antitype so baptism in and of itself does not save you it only saves you as an antitype, and then Peter clarifies that by saying, as a, a, a pledge or a, a response of a good conscience towards God. And so Peter is very careful to say, look, this water baptism doesn't remove the dirt from your body. Mm -hmm. It simply corresponds to something greater, what God has done already in your heart. And so Peter doesn't actually say baptism saves you. He says it saves you as a type, an antitype rather, a corresponding antitype. So would the word antitype, what a synonym to the word antitype would be symbol or more than symbol? Right. Like, yeah, it'd be a symbol or, or another good word we could use would be counterpart, a okay. counterpart. And okay. so, and so Peter's very careful. And first Peter 3, 18, he already told us that, that Christ died for the ungodly. He, he suffered once so that he might bring us to God. Notice Peter says, it's Christ who brings us to God. Mm. And then in 1 Peter 1, 2, he says, we're saved by what? By the, the foreknowledge, foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctification of the Spirit, and by the sprinkling of the blood of, of Christ. And so mm. he wraps it up in the triune God. The triune God, the Father foreknows, he elects his people, the Spirit sanctifies us, and we are redeemed by the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And and that sprinkling, Anthony, is, is deliberate. Uh, Peter is referring to the sprinkling yes. of the blood on the mercy seat on mm -hmm. the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. So mm -hmm. Peter's being very clear that he's not talking about baptism uh, per se that does the work of salvation, mm -hmm. but rather it functions as a symbol. All right. Would that sprinkling also correspond to Ezekiel 36? For, absolutely. Absolutely. And Ezekiel 36 would tie in with John 3, 5, uh, where Jesus speaks about being born of the water and born of the spirit. And so we can discuss that as well.
Sure. So now, okay, what would, what would be your pushback in opposition to this view? Obviously, you, and, you know, we, we both don't hold to baptismal regeneration. How would you push back on that? On which one, uh, Anthony? Baptismal regeneration. In other words, yes. we, we don't okay. hold to that. Right. right. Uh, the way I push back on that is simply by looking at, for example, Romans 8, 5 to 8, where Paul says the, that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing we can do to please God. And so when we ask the question, uh, where does the desire for baptism come from? Does it come from the fleshly man? Or does it come from the man who's in the spirit? Well, obviously, we cannot obey God if we're in the flesh. Paul says that. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They're not subject to the law of God, nor, nor can they be. Sure. It's impossible. And so in order for someone to say, you know what, I have a desire to be baptized in obedience to Christ's command, that is not a fleshly, uh, 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 that's not a fleshly impulse. That is something that is given by the Spirit of God who regenerates us. But that step of obedience, remember, our good works have been preordained that we should follow them, Ephesians mm -hmm. 2.10. And so what I would say is this, baptism regeneration is false on the grounds that it is God who regenerates us and makes us willing to obey him into baptism. And therefore, just like Abraham brought Isaac to the altar to sacrifice him, Abraham was already declared uh, righteous and just in God's sight. God declared him to be just. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Abraham wasn't declared just after he offered up Isaac, but he was already, he was reckoned unto him as righteousness because he believed on the Lord, even before his circumcision. Mm -hmm. So, baptismal regeneration, unfortunately, is, is really, if you trace it, it really is a man-made doctrine. Right. So, would you, is, is this heresy? Is it a damnable heresy? What, um, how, would, how would it fit in? Well, I, I wouldn't say it's a damnable, I wouldn't say it's a damnable heresy. But what I would say is that if you follow it to its logical conclusion, then what you're basically doing is you are, you are at the cusp of negating justification by faith alone. So, right. so take Luther, for example. I mean, Luther before 1525. Now, you'll notice, Anthony, I mentioned that year of 1525. Something happened in 1525 in Germany that really that rattled Luther. And that was the, 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 the peasants' uh, revolt. Uh, when the peasants started taking Luther's ideas of the Reformation and, you know, breaking down churches and, 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 and beating up priests and so forth, Luther became very disillusioned with, with what happened. And he became a lot more, let's say, liturgical, more ecclesiastical. Mm -hmm. And so what you find is that Luther still maintained justification by faith alone, mm -hmm. but he ends up defending baptism regeneration. And so... There are Lutherans that I know who love the Lord and are trusting Christ alone for their salvation. But if I were to ask them, do you believe that a child is made a child of God at baptism? They'll say yes. Mm. And so I think I think it's one of those areas, like our Arminian brothers who think that it was their choice that brought them to salvation and mm -hmm. it, it was their decision to accept Christ. Right. I think that there's a lot of Arminian brethren who are truly saved. Sure. But I think they have a, a misunderstanding of the, 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 I, the, the, the doctrines of grace. And they have a misunderstanding of how God woos us by his grace and brings us mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that baptism regeneration, I would say, is on, is on that cusp. And, and I think that it's an area that we need to logically argue Sure. Uh, in good faith with our Lutheran brethren, like our brother Chris, that we were supposed to engage in. Mm -hmm. um, but with Roman Catholicism, it's a different animal altogether. Roman Catholicism denies the sola gratia, sola fide, yeah. sola scriptura, uh, unlike the Lutherans. So it, it is a serious question, and it's an area I think that we as believers have to dialogue with with our brothers in in, in those different denominations. Right, because the danger could be uh, from a man a man centered point of view. Well, I was baptized, right? So, and they end up having faith in their baptism and the fact that they were baptized, and right. that's what brought me into the kingdom of God. So, therefore, I'm right. a Christian, and they're right. pointing to something that uh, was done by human hands, not done by the Spirit of God. And that's right. That, that could exactly be a serious right. a serious error. Exactly right. And I've heard people use that type of language. Uh, people right. in the Christian Reformed Church who would say, well, my son is not following the Lord, but 
but he was baptized and God's going to honor that. Well, yeah. God, it's as if to say God is going to honor what we did. Well, it's right. not about God honoring what we did. It's about, it's about God's honor and right. the glory that is all his, uh, in his, in his sovereign right to choose his people. Right. Yeah. God is going to honor what he did in the form of punishment. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I hate to say yeah. it that way, but yeah, the only thing he honors is the death is the cross of Christ and the resurrection. Right. Uh, he honors that, but you're right. He, God will also honor his justice as well. Okay. So um, baptismal regeneration is something that's held by Lutherans, Eastern Orthodox also? Yep, yep, they okay. hold that. Eastern Orthodox, however, don't believe in sola uh, gratia, sola fide. They believe that works. I mean, they will say it's by grace alone, but they will tell you that without baptism, you, you cannot be saved. And uh, you, you need the church to receive the, they don't call them sacraments, they call them the divine mysteries. Uh, and so in order to, in order to become absorbed into what they call the, the, tri, the triadic life of God, that they call it theosis, uh, you have to be part of the church and you have to engage in the liturgy of the church and so forth. So Eastern Orthodoxy, just like Rome, uh, does believe that you are saved by grace, but you're kept by law. So it's the same thing in the end. Right. You know, and you know what I'll do? Because you and Eli did a great uh, talk on that. You reviewed Hank Hanegraaff's uh, right. interview with Eli. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to that in, in the comment section. So if anybody wants to look up Eastern Orthodoxy and learn more about it, you did two sessions with Eli, and I thought they were, they were excellent. Very, very informative. Thank you. So as far as baptismal regeneration go, did any of the early church fathers hold to that? Yes, a, a number of them did hold to that. And some people would argue, well, there you go. I mean, the church fathers held to this, so therefore, not all of them, obviously. When we talk about the church fathers, Anthony, we need to be very, very careful because we're talking about a, a huge, broad area. Differences of opinions exist. Um, some of these church fathers were deeply influenced by Greek philosophy. Uh, Justin Martyr was very influenced by Plato's Platonic philosophy. St. Augustine also was, uh, was influenced by Neoplatonism. Uh, so we need to be careful in these areas because some of the fathers looked at this through Greek philosophical lenses. Um, uh, others believed that baptism was something that should be delayed until your deathbed. So a lot of these fathers did not hold to infant baptism as a means to save the child. Mm -hmm. There was, we know from, um, uh, there's some uh, tombs that scholars have found uh, from the second century AD that have uh, on the epitaphs on the tombstones, they will mention a child that, that died and was baptized. And what we know from that early period is that children would have been baptized in, in times of emergency, like clinical death, when they're approaching mm -hmm. death. Mm -hmm. But why would they need to do that if they were baptized very early after their birth? Um, so we need, we need to ask these questions. Why did they delay this baptism? Uh, and there's many examples of this. Uh, in the West, in the Western Church, what we do know is that the idea of infant baptism and baptism regeneration really gets its driving force from St. Augustine. So about the year 410 AD, that's where it really starts to get pushed very mm -hmm. hard in the West. Um, but there are fathers of the Church that did hold to this. Um, but then again, we need to understand that the, the Church Fathers, number one, uh, a lot of folks will look back in history. So the Roman Catholic will look down the long well of history. And at the bottom of the well, you know, Anthony, there's, there's water, right? You look down the well and there's water. You see your reflection. Mm -hmm. So the Roman Catholic looks down the well of history to the fathers of the church and they'll say, ah, St. Saint, Saint Athanasius was a Roman Catholic. All the church fathers were Roman Catholic. <laughs> and then the Orthodox will look down and say, they were all Orthodox. And then the Reformed Baptists will say, ah, they were all Reformed Baptists. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we need to let them be the you know we need to let the church fathers be the church fathers right. and we need to understand Anthony that we need to hold them to the same scrutiny that we hold each other to and that is we need to use the scriptures as our standard um, so if you take um, Irenaeus for example Irenaeus about AD 150 he says that he um, was taught by the Apostle John and he claims that he received from apostolic tradition this is the first use of the term apostolic tradition in Irenaeus. He says that he received from apostolic tradition that Jesus was 50 years old when he died. Hmm. Now, I don't know one Roman Catholic scholar, Protestant scholar, Orthodox scholar, who believes that Jesus was 50 years old when he died. 
Mm. So they usually place them at 30, 33, 32, sure. around 30 to 33. But, but notice Irenaeus says he got this from the apostles. Mm. Already at this early stage in Christian history, you've got this guy saying for the first time, this comes from apostolic tradition. And yet we all know through reading the New Testament very clearly that Jesus had a three-year ministry and that he started when he was about 30. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why Irenaeus does this is because of the Greek concept of the, 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 the three ages of man, the, you know, when he's a child, when he's an adult, and then when he's a mature adult. And so what he was trying to say was that in Jesus, he was recapitulating all of life in himself. Mm. And so this is why I've always said, be very careful when you read the fathers. They're right. not infallible. And they right. openly admitted that, that they were not, they never said their writings were scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so if we take the patristic root, we need to understand that there's, there's some weird things that the fathers of the church speak of too. Like St. Basil the Great said that when you baptize, you have to face uh, Jerusalem and you have to be baptized with your face going down into the water, like head first right. with your face. <laughs> and, and, and to do it nine times, three times for each person of the Trinity. So I don't know anybody, I don't know Orthodox or Roman Catholics or Protestants who baptize that way. But Basil yeah, said, this is the way we do it. Wow. Okay. So, so the, it, it seems like the early church fathers look much like the Protestant church does today. Yeah. Yeah. In many we're, we're united on the essentials. Exactly. And, and, and you know, we vary on the non-essentials, let's say. Exactly. And mm -hmm. in all things, we need charity. Char right. Yeah. That's that, uh, that phrase in all things, uh, in the essentials, unity and the non-essentials, liberty and in all things, charity or love. Exactly. So I think, exactly. I think, I think that's important. And when, when people, uh, like Roman Catholics point to the early church fathers and say that they, they, there's unanimity, uh, unanimous consent of the fathers, there's no such thing. No. No, no, no. Even with my debate with Robert Genis, Anthony, which you moderated, <laughs> yes. remember that? Yes, uh, I do. <laughs> in Carlisle, in Pennsylvania, if you remember that, uh, Robert was saying, "Oh yeah, all the all the early fathers believed in the Immaculate Conception," uh, and yet you've got church fathers saying, "Yeah, Mary uh, sinned. Uh, yeah, Mary uh, 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 um, sinned with the sin of, of doubt and arrogance and so mm. forth." Um, so again, uh, none of the fathers at the Council of Nicaea. There were three hundred eighteen bishops that assembled at the council of nicaea we don't know any of those fathers who said anything about mary that the modern roman catholic church says the assumption the immaculate conception uh, all those the perpetual virginity of mary uh, but i think on the subject of baptism what we'll find is that many of the church fathers actually would defer baptism uh, as close as possible to death near death so constantine the great constantine the emperor Mm -hmm. um, wasn't baptized until his deathbed. And, and the same goes with many other Christians. And the question once again is, if infant baptism was the standard, why is it that Constantine and, and even the children of many Christians were delayed baptism until they were able to understand the Christian faith? So there's, there's a famous martyr, uh, Tony, called uh, uh, Perpetua. Perpetua right. was a, a, a woman, a Christian sister in Christ, she was imprisoned uh, in Rome, and uh, she had a child. She had a baby. And before she was led out to the Colosseum to, to, to be fed to the, to the lions and so forth, she asked for baptism. Well, there she is. She's asking for baptism right before she goes to her martyrdom. But here's the funny thing, uh, Anthony. Um, she was baptized, but she didn't have her child baptized, which hmm. is very strange. Because, if, yeah. again, if infant baptism was the standard, you would think that Perpetua would have asked for her child to be baptized, baptized as well, but he wasn't. Right. Yeah, I, I, I hate to say that, that that's a departure from justification by faith alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I, I don't know the state of her soul, but it seems to me that in waiting uh, to the end of your life to be baptized, it, you're, you're, you're waiting for that baptism and pointing to that baptism yeah. as the operation that's going to save you. And anything that you're pointing to outside of Christ alone is, is a work of man, which. Yeah. Is... And, and the reason why they deferred baptism, uh, Anthony, was there was a belief uh, that, that if you committed grievous sins after baptism, there was a belief that um, you, your salvation could be on the line mm -hmm. if, if you committed these sins. And that's why, if you notice 
they would defer these baptisms near to near the end of their deaths. Mm. Uh, that way, they can guarantee that they don't sin uh, because they're on their way out. But uh, but you're right that that was the understanding that that they had. Wow, wow. Okay, so that kind of encapsulates baptismal regeneration in in a short period of time. Let's move on to. Uh, infant baptism or pedo baptism where right. does the term pedo baptism come from well the word pedo baptism is just a greek word the word pedo means uh, child uh, like we use the word uh, uh, pediatrics pediatrician mm -hmm. and so it simply refers to a child and so pedo baptism means the baptism of a child or an infant um, so that's that's basically a term that was created to distinguish it from cradle baptism that is baptism for believers right now the, the groups that i would say that would still be considered reformed would be presbyterians that hold to pedo baptism correct right right okay. and uh, the christian reformed church as well okay. uh, and uh, there are low uh, anglicans the evangelical uh the Ang evangelical wing of the uh, anglican church um uh, would uh, would also hold to pedo baptism uh, methodists uh, would hold to uh, pedo baptism and some of the Wesleyan churches well Methodism is a form of, of Wesleyanism and so uh, so a number of these churches uh, would perform uh, infant baptism or pedo right baptism. and and obviously Lutherans would also hold to infant yes. baptism yes. but only out of that group really only um, pr uh, uh, Presbyterians would be considered reformed right we wouldn't consider Lutherans reformed would right. you consider Ang Anglicans reformed there are a number of Anglicans that are strongly reformed. Um, I mean, even in the history of Anglicanism, when 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 the Church of England was formed, uh, if you read Thomas Cranmer's uh, uh, Book of Common Prayer and the Thirty Nine Articles of Faith of the Church of England, Cranmer was a very had a very strong reformed bent to him. And, and even today, there are uh, there are very strong reformed Anglicans today. Uh, and then again, there's the Anglo-Catholics, the, the, the high Anglican church, which is more closer to the Roman Catholic side of things. Um, but, but even with Lutheranism, I mean, you know, Luther did begin with a very strong sense of predestination, bondage of the will. Um, but I think uh, Melanchthon, after Luther's death, Melanchthon kind of, let's say, did a reformation of Lutheranism himself. Mm. Okay. And one, one strong Anglican reform guy that comes to my is, mind is Michael Horton. Right. Right. That's right. You know, and he would have That's to right. And I think Jerry Packer would have leaned in that direction. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, Michael Horton for sure. So what would be the scriptures that a Presbyterian or someone who holds to pedo baptism, what would be the scriptures that they point to that would lead them or someone else to believe, yes, we should be baptizing our, our babies? Right. Now they all believe, all pedo Baptists believe that that the New Testament has uh, baptism by immersion, and they also believe that adults were baptized. Mm -hmm. The only the only places they go to to argue for pedo baptism is they would go to the household baptisms in the Book of Acts, where you read about uh, this person believed and was baptized and his whole household. Right. And right. The, the assumption there is that the household, and again, this, these are assumptions. The assumption is the household would include infants, even though the text doesn't say that. And an indirect text they use is where Jesus says, suffer not the children to come unto me, for to them belong the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that's just an indirect uh, side note they use. Uh, and so the problem with that, of course, is that um, when they mention these household baptisms, they're following what the Westminster Confession of Faith says, good and necessary inferences. Mm. And, and what that means is that, well, if they had households, then they must have had infants in there. But right. that's not what it says. So the refutation for that, I think, is very clear that everywhere we read about household ba baptisms, you always hear about them hearing the word, mm -hmm. and they believe, the plural uh, pronouns are used, they believe, and then they were baptized. Um, so to include infants in there, I think, is really, really a, a, a push. Right. And the way I think about it, um, if an infant is, is baptized, uh, and the scripture says repent or believe and be baptized, belief and repentance would follow baptism in that situation. Correct. Whereas I see scripturally, it's repent and believe and then be baptized. Correct. So that would have to precede baptism, which 
is a picture of our union and our uh, our identification with the death, burial, and resurrection right, of, right. of Jesus. I mean, yeah, I mean, Luther had to play with words like, well, the child reaches out in childlike faith. The way a child reaches uh, to be suckled by its mother, uh, the child in faith reaches out to Christ. Well, I mean, that's very melodramatic, but again, there's nothing biblical. There's nothing to back that up biblically, nothing at all. Right, yeah. So here's a question, because I believe that um, Presbyterians hold that this puts the child in the covenant, right? I mean, is that is that what... Are those, is that something that they hold to concretely? They do. And the problem with that, Anthony, is because they believe that baptism is the New Testament sign uh, that that corresponds to the Old Testament sign of circumcision. Mm -hmm. And so most of them take Colossians 2.12, where Paul talks about circumcision, and he talks about we were buried with him in baptism. And and the issue here is they'll say the Old Testament type, uh, the, the sign, rather, that brings the person into the covenant and the Old Testament was circumcision, and that has been superseded in the New Covenant by baptism. And, and they believe that baptism uh, it brings the child into the covenant. They become part of the faith community. And so baptism ushers the child um, into that new covenant. Uh, and there's a lot of problems with that. Well, first of all, the problem with circumcision and baptism, that's a major problem. And the other problem is the idea that children are inducted into the covenant merely by baptism. So would Presbyterians say that when, when a child is baptized, he's brought into the visible church, not necessarily the covenant? Or does it have to be both? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how we, we define the covenant. Um, they would say that they enter into not just the visible church, but they believe that 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 reception of the child into the community of faith also brings them into the uh, invisible church as well. And that's why they talk about the promises God, uh, the promises that God makes in baptism to us and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, mm -hmm. But that is, that is so rife with so many problems. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, and in my conversations with some people, uh, they said that if once the child is baptized, God would see that child differently than a child who wasn't baptized but is being raised in the church hmm. and yeah it's it's strange isn't it anthony that they're very strongly reformed but yet there's something god it, it, god reacts to something we do which which again sounds like anathema to our reformed baptist ears <laughs> because the idea is that there's nothing we can do that can please god uh and 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 it's not god doesn't owe us anything I mean, mm -hmm. other than judgment. Um, and so to say that God uh, looks at this child in a different manner in which he looks at an unbaptized child, uh, I, I just don't see that. I mean, they try to use 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul talks about uh, a, Mary, a Christian who's married to an unbeliever, but then he says, but then your children are holy, otherwise they would be unclean. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's by virtue of the fact that the child is receiving this counsel of the gospel he's he or she is hearing the gospel mm -hmm. from the believing parent and so in that sense the child is is receiving if you will the the influence the 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 let's say the the filling over of of the cup of that christian uh, parent mm -hmm. that will educate that child or or speak the gospel to that child's life and first corinthians 7 paul's not even talking about baptism he's talking about marriage uh, and in, in this case, between a believer and, and a person who remained an unbeliever. Right. But wouldn't the, the common grace of God being raised in a church uh, be extended to children, whether they were baptized or not? Yes, definitely. Because he causes the rain to fall on both the good and the bad. And his son, the sun shines on both the good and the bad. So common grace is indiscriminate. God does not discriminate in allowing all of his creatures to breathe the oxygen that he's created. Um, and so I, I agree with you that there's nothing in scripture that would suggest that a, a, that a baptized child, uh, I mean, that, that very concept is not even, it's an oxymoron. The scripture doesn't even speak in those terms. Um, I think that it's, it's more of a, of a man-made idea rather than a, a biblical doctrine.
Right, because our baptism is, is again, a picture of our union with Christ. And if these infants are not in union with Christ, it, it must be picturing some future union that may or may not happen. Right. So I, I just don't see how that would, be, how they can consider that child to actually be in the new covenant. You yeah, know, when, and I think, and I think the new covenant, Anthony, is is it's delineated for us, is it not? In Hebrews eight, quoting from Jeremiah thirty one thirty one. Mm-hmm that it's God who will make that new covenant. It's God who will write his laws in our hearts and put his commandments in our minds. Mm -hmm. And then he says this, he says, uh, no one will have to say to them, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. So in the new covenant, um, they have an immediate awareness of God. They have an immediate awareness of their salvation with God. And you cannot be in the covenant unless God has brought you into the covenant by his grace, written his laws in your heart, and um, they, all, all those who are in the covenant, in the new covenant, all of them know him. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. But in, in this Presbyterian idea of the covenant community, not all these children know the Lord because a lot of these kids tend to apostatize at some point. They walk away from the church. Uh, and so do they, are they really in that new covenant? Because the only ones in, it, it, the only ones in that new covenant are those who know the Lord. Mm-hmm. And that certainly cannot be said of many people who've been baptized in, in these denominations and then later don't even think about God or have no interest in the gospel whatsoever. Right. And it, it kind of uh, deflects away from the beauty and the superiority of the new covenant because everyone who God places in the new covenant will be saved. There is no, there is no falling away. God, God seals us in the Holy Spirit. He writes his law on our hearts and he compels us to keep them. He puts a fear of him in our hearts that we will not turn to the right or to the left. That's right. I will cause them to walk in my ways. Right. And, and, and we also, we, we need to realize that um, the new covenant is is based on better promises, mm-hmm. better mediator, better sacrifice, uh, better priesthood. And the difference between the old and the new covenant is that in the old covenant, you can be made part of the uh, the, the, the community of faith, mm-hmm. but that didn't guarantee your spiritual salvation because God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. Esau had the sign of circumcision in his flesh, and God did not respect that sign. Uh, God did not even choose Esau. And so in the New Covenant, the only ones who are in, I mean, in one respect, it is a VIP covenant. It's people that God has elected and saved by his sovereign choice. Uh, There is no unregenerate people in the New Covenant, I think. The only people in the New Covenant are those who are regenerated. Uh, And so it's impossible to speak about, you know, people being in the covenant but not fully regenerate. Those are not New Testament terms. Right. So the, the pushback that I generally get when, when I talk about this is, well, when we baptize someone, let's say we're, uh, we're, we're going to have a baptism in our church uh, next month uh, and we're baptizing two, two young fellows. How do we know for certain that they're baptized? I mean, that they're saved. We may be baptizing someone who's not truly regenerate. So in that instance, we're baptizing an unbeliever and that would be their, their pushback. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we can see the example in the book of Acts 8, right? When uh, we find that uh, Philip, when he went to Samaria, we learned that uh, even Simon Magus was baptized. Mm -hmm. And and God didn't honor his baptism. I mean, he wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit from Peter. (laughs) And Peter said, you know, he said, may you and your money perish. Uh, And you know, Peter, he was a fisherman. So you know that everywhere he spat, the grass never grew green again. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and he would have what what he basically said was you, you can go to hell with your money. That's basically what he was saying. Right. May you and your money perish. Um, so what I would say in response to that is that um, as 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 elders or pastors, if someone comes to us and says they put their faith in Christ, and and we see uh, what seems to be fruit of the Holy Spirit, and and we go ahead and baptize them, uh, well, we've done our part. We fulfilled uh, our our commission by Christ's command. If this person deceived us or was just pretending to be a godly person, that person is going to answer to the Lord for what they've done. They're, they're answerable to the Lord and, and they will face judgment because if they weren't regenerated in the first place, then they've simply mocked uh, the, the sign of baptism. Um, and that, but that's very different than baptizing a child who has no decision in, 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 that, in that event 
to baptize a child without knowing what he or she is doing, that's a completely different story. And then telling that child, as that child's growing up, that you're in the covenant and that God will honor the promises made in baptism, that's a completely different story. Sure. Whereas, whereas an adult, uh, someone of sound mind, uh, who, who receives baptism, just like Simon Magus. I mean, Peter didn't scold Philip for baptizing him. Uh, Peter told Simon Magus, may you and your money perish. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's not exactly the same thing because a child is not responsible and does not know and is not conscious of what is happening. Right. So I think we're dealing here, Anthony, with, with it, it'd be apples and oranges here. Right, I, I agree. So now prior to Augustine, which of the early church fathers would have promoted infant baptism and which ones would you say wouldn't or would, would have promoted the believer's baptism? Well, from what, from what we see before Augustine, the, the idea of baptizing children was, was again, it, there was various views. Um, some of the Eastern fathers would see baptism to a child as, as uh, conferring the gifts of God on the child and grace, sanctification, so forth. But then others, you find cases where they defer bath baptism uh, to children only in cases of danger, like the mm. child is dying. And so we want to baptize the child. Um, so we have differences of opinions here. So take St. Augustine, for example. He tells us in his confessions, he, he complains about his mother, Monica, who was a godly woman who prayed all her life for Augustine's mm. conversion. He complained that when he was a young child, he became gravely ill. And at one point, uh, he thought he was going to die. And Monica didn't have him baptized. And he complained about her. And he says, Mother, you know, do you realize you could have sent me into hell? Do you realize that uh, in deferring my baptism, you would have sent me into the flames of hell? Uh, and so the question arises, well, why did Monica baptize Augustine when he was an infant? She didn't. And she didn't baptize him when he was a, a, a a 10-year-old. She didn't baptize him when he was a teenager, obviously. Uh, and so this begs the question, well, mm -hmm. if infant baptism was normative in the church, then why was Augustine not baptized? And then you've got Ambrose, Augustine's uh, mentor and teacher. Ambrose uh, was baptized later in life, as was, uh, as I mentioned already, Constantine. Uh, and Basil as well. Basil and Gregory of Nyssa, they were baptized later in life. Mm -hmm. So what we're finding, uh, Anthony, is that we don't see this urgency to baptize infants um, right after birth uh, in the earliest years of the church. What we find is that when Augustine starts fighting with Pelagius, and Pelagians, by the way, were Pado baptists as well. Pelagians baptized infants as well. Mm. Um, but Augustine, because of his battles with Pelagianism, the Pelagius, and the whole idea of um, uh, Pelagius says we're all born perfect, we're all born with a clean slate, a tabula rasa, mm. and uh, Augustine says, no, we're not born uh, innocent, we all have original sin. And so Augustine began to push for this baptism, uh, immediate baptism, shortly after birth, usually about seven to eight days, trying to mimic the circumcision rite. Um, and the reason why Augustine did that was because he truly believed that children without baptism would not go to heaven, that they would actually go not exactly into hell because they're infants, but not exactly into heaven. So it's something like, think of it this way, Anthony, it's something like, it's like brunch. It's not exactly breakfast and it's not exactly lunch, right? right. But, but there's a cantaloupe at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and so, Augustine said, look, children will go into limbo, which is almost like a, let's just say it's an eternal playground where children get to play, <laughs> but they never experience the loving presence of God. Mm -hmm. So Augustine is the driving force mm -hmm. to this idea of uh, infant baptism as soon as possible after birth. But before Augustine, again, it's a mixed bag. You've got people deferring mm -hmm. baptism until uh, later, until the kid is older. Perpetua didn't have her baby baptized when she uh, in the prison cell before she was martyred. So you're looking at a mixed bag. But if you really want to know where this 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 emergency idea of we got to baptize infants, we got to baptize infants, that begins. Scholars point to about 410 AD 
uh, shortly after the fight with Pelagius. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the Council of Carthage in 418 in North Africa, they actually passed a law, an ecclesiastical law, that children, a baptism of children should not be delayed. Uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and that was because of Augustine's influence and push. Um, and uh, that was a local council. It was not an ecumenical council. That is, it was not binding on all the churches, but it was local and it was, and it, and it carried the support of Augustine. Wow. So when it comes to Augustine, we want to embrace him because of his view on depravity, but we want to smack him because of his view on baptism. Yeah. So, so, so the Protestants, I mean, Calvin said Augustine is all ours. Uh, in the, in his doctrines of grace, mm -hmm. and, I mean, and Augustine believed too in predestination, and and he believed in the election. They had a very strong view of God's predestination, mm -hmm. and but but then someone asked him, he said, "Wait a minute, Augustine, you believe that God elects His people of salvation, but then what's what's with this infant baptism and mm -hmm. getting them baptized?" You know what he said? He says, "Well, all those whom God elects, will, all these infants will get baptized, uh, and 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 those who aren't baptized weren't elect by God." And so this is how we tried to balance this whole thing of election and wow. baptism regeneration by saying that all those whom God elects will get baptized. Wow. As a quick aside, didn't uh, Pope uh, Benedict uh, do away with limbo? Didn't he say limbo? Yes. Was, yes. Uh, yes, he affection? did. He did. Yeah, he did. Which again raises the question of, you know, the consensus of yeah. the fathers. Uh, it looks like the popes don't really agree with the consensus of the fathers. Uh, and again, that wasn't the consensus of the fathers because mm -hmm. they all had different opinions. But yes, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, uh, Pope Emeritus, uh, he uh, he <laughs> he did he did away with that, and 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 also he moved towards um, let's just say uh, softening the whole issue of purgatory mm -hmm. and, and trying to damp uh, to downplay the severity of of purgatory by talking about things like well, you know. The purgatory is not really a place of, of temporal time, which is weird because historically the Roman church thought that purgatory does include time. Right. You got to make up time. It's you yeah. do the crime, you, you do the time in purgatory. Right. Um, and the whole Sabbatine, I don't want to get off topic, but the <laughs> whole Sabbatine doctrine. Yeah. That every Saturday, Mary descends into purgatory mm -hmm. and, and, and rescues a number of souls out of purgatory. So if you really want to benefit from the Sabbatine uh, privilege, you want to make sure you die a Friday night so that Saturday, Mary can come <laughs> down and get you out of there. Instead yeah, of we're, working all week. Right. Week. Worst, worst case, you're only in there for six days anyway. I mean, it's not, it's not that bad. That's and isn't, right. isn't, it wasn't that something that uh, Mother Angelica would, yes. would drum away at? And she says, if you wore your scapula, if That's you were right. found wearing your scapula when you yes. died, yes. the Sabatine privilege would be invoked and Mary would descend out of heaven into purgatory. Correct. On, sa on the Saturday after you die. That's, and, That's and, right. Right. Yeah. So Our Lady of Carmel, Mount Carmel, the whole idea of Our Lady of Mount Carmel was uh, she promised that whoever dies wearing the scapular will not suffer, uh, will not suffer eternal fire. So, yeah, it's it's one of the the many uh, Roman, the decretals, of, uh, what did Luther call it? He called them one of the many uh, Roman, uh, many, many of the, the decretals from the Roman dunghill. Wow. As to it. Yeah. wow. I got a, uh, a question coming in from one of our brothers at Hope. He said, did any of these early church fathers and proponents of baptism in emergency circumstances speak to the need to baptize the sinner on the cross next to Jesus that would, uh, that would be with him in paradise? I didn't see anyone rushing to sprinkle water on him. Yeah, no, no, they never did. Uh, and yet that is, uh, that is an argument that, of course, we all, we all recognize the fact that the thief on the cross who turned in faith to the Lord Jesus, uh, if, you, if you listen to the interaction between him and the Lord, uh, the first thing you notice is he recognizes that he's a despicable sinner. He recognizes his total depravity. That, that He tells the other guy, don't you fear God? Don't you understand that we, we're getting the just desserts for what we've done? But this man has done nothing. And, and then he recognizes Jesus' uh, messianic status. He says, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Now, mm -hmm. again, um, that man was regenerated on the cross. Uh, that was not a man who, 
you know, how did he know that Jesus was a king? How did he know that he had a kingdom? Uh, he's, a, he's, 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 he's stark naked, hanging on a cross uh, with his flesh ripped to pieces. And he's, he's looking at him saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And, and it's interesting that the Lord Jesus didn't say, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, you should have been baptized first and I would have given you additional grace and so forth. No one came with a bucket of water and poured and threw it at him. Um, he didn't have time to be confirmed or, you know, have communion and so forth, his first communion. No, the Lord Jesus simply said to him, today you shall be with me in paradise. He didn't just say, today you'll be with me in paradise. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, right. barely, barely. In Greek, it's amen, amen. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the greatest way to state something with absolute certainty. And Jesus is the only one who did that. You don't find people saying that before Jesus. We, also, we usually end our prayers with amen, which means so let it be. But Jesus predicated very important statements with the double assertion of the amen. Mm -hmm. So John 3, 3, verily, verily, I say to you, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So whenever you see those verily, verilys, it means, mm -hmm. you know, tune up, listen up, because what he is saying is of the utmost importance. Yeah, we, we both have a, a, a very good friend in common. I'm not going to uh, say who it is, but he's, he's flirting with um, possibly baptismal regeneration, but baptism as a requirement for salvation. So when I brought the, you know, the thief on the cross up to him, he says, well, that's, that's an outlier. That's not, not the normative practice. And that was before the resurrection of Christ. After the resurrection of Christ, it was taught by the apostles that you needed to be baptized. Right. So how would you, how would you respond to that in the sense yeah. that we're, we're looking at a one-off situation. There aren't other situations like that. that we're yeah. To. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, he's making it sound like it was easier before the cross to be saved than after the cross. It was simpler when it's really the other way around. But the, the fact of the matter is, Anthony, that the means by which God has saved his people mm -hmm. through the centuries has always been through faith. Always. Abraham was not justified by anything he did. It was not by circumcision. He was justified by faith. And uh, uh, Hebrews 11 points out that it was by faith that Noah pleased God. It was by faith that uh, Isaac and Jacob and, and he goes on to Joseph and Moses and he goes through that whole Old Testament line. In other words, the, the means of salvation has never changed. And even though Jesus had not yet died on the cross, we, we need to understand that the atonement of Christ was already present in God's mind. God mm -hmm. is, is transtemporal. And, and so from God's vantage point, the whole gamut of salvation was already present to him. He already knows his elect. His elect are there. And that's why we can believe in the chain of redemption, that those whom he calls, he predestined, and those right. who he predestined, he justified, and they will end up being glorified. It's a done deal. And so what I would say, Anthony, is that the means of salvation uh, has never changed. It's always been the same. You know, the, I mean, C.I. Schofield, one of the fathers of American dispensationalism, actually argued in his first edition of the C.I. Schofield Bible that in the Old Testament, Jews were saved by their works, and then the New Covenant were saved by faith. No, mm, no, no. It has always been on, on the basis of faith. And so that thief that was saved was already saved on the basis of Christ, even before Christ died. Christ had not yet died, technically. But he was saved on the basis of the finished work of Christ and his resurrection that was already a, a realized fact in the mind of God, uh, even though it had not yet materialized in time and in space yet in history. So uh, it's not a one-off. It, it is a consistent stream of redemption that we find throughout all of Scripture. Right. In, in fact, I just I just want to read something out of John 3 because I always, I always read this, and to me— I took it to understand that being born of God's spirit was not something um, new to the new covenant. It was, I should say, it's part of the new covenant, but exi it, that existed during Old Testament times. Because speaking about being born again, uh, John 3.11, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the new birth. So is it, is is Jesus saying in in that particular instance that he's that he has seen new birth prior to his death, burial, and resurrection? Well, if we grant his his deity and his the fact that he is the eternal Son of God, then yes, of course he would have he would have witnessed that 
in 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 his dealings with his people in the Old Testament and and speaking through the prophets, speaking to Moses and so forth. So uh, absolutely. The question though, Anthony, is that John 3.11 is problematic in the sense that what, what does the we refer to? Some scholars think that Jesus may be referring to John the Baptist and himself mm -hmm. because John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ were both witnesses uh, to, to what he came to do. That John witnessed, he heard right. the father's voice saying, this is my son, who am I well pleased and mm -hmm. so forth. So, the question is, who is the we here? Is it referring to the uh, the Trinity, the mm -hmm. persons of the Trinity, or is it referring to Jesus and John? Because shortly after that, he talks about the bridegroom standing by the the, 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 the best man standing next to the bridegroom and rejoicing to hear his voice. And mm -hmm. and so there's a connection made there between Jesus and, and Baptist, John the Baptist. So it, it all depends on who the we are there. Mm -hmm. So Okay. Okay. All right. So, so far we've hit baptismal regeneration and infant baptism. Uh, let's now move to believer's baptism, which is also known as credo baptism, correct? Right. So out of the reformed camp, who else besides reformed Baptists, which are the only group I know that hold to believer's baptism, are there any other reformed groups that hold to believer's baptism? Uh, not, not that I know of. Not that I know of. Um, the Reformed movement, the Reformed Baptist movement, maybe we should, probably for the sake of our hearers, we should probably explain a little bit about what happened with the Reformed, how the Reformed Baptists came about. Please. Uh, now, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, uh, and Knox, these, these great magisterial reformers, you know, the, we call them the magisterial because they, they were not just teachers, but they also believed in the power of the magistrates. Uh, they believed in the church state. So it's what we call sacralism, the mm -hmm. idea that the church and the state uh, function together. And that, of course, led to a lot of problems. The, the, the first time that happened was under Constantine, and uh, that has led to a lot of problems. The very fact that, that your country, Anthony, was born out of this declaration of independence, this idea that that there's a separation of the church and the state, that, that, that government shall make no law concerning the free exercise of religion or forbid the free exercise thereof, is based on the Puritan view. The Puritans, many of them were Reformed Baptists as well. Mm -hmm. And it was the pilgrims, the, the Puritans from England, who came in the, the, the famous Mayflower voyage. They came to the Americas, created New England, and they began to teach this idea of the separation. Because they came from an oppressive uh, monarchy in England that basically said it's the Church of England, you must conform to the, to the Church of England, and, and the Puritans were the nonconformists. They didn't conform. People like John Bunyan, who was pr placed in prison because he was not an Anglican clergyman. Mm. All of that to say this, Anthony, that in the time of Luther and Calvin, there arose a movement in Switzerland uh, uh, known as the Swiss Brethren. And these were reformers who came to be known as the radical reformers, or they were called the stepchildren of the Reformation, <laughs> because people like um, people like um, uh, 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 Conrad Grebel, John Slater, folks like that began to arise in Switzerland and Germany, and disciples of Zwingli approached him and said, "Look, uh, brother." Uh, the Reformation is great. It's wonderful. But there's only one problem. We haven't pushed far enough. We're still holding on to these Roman Catholic inklings. Mm -hmm. And they said, they challenged Zwingli on this. And they said, why are we baptizing infants? Mm -hmm. and, and at one point, Zwingli was actually siding with the what would be called the Anabaptists. But then he decided to stick to the church-state solution and therefore maintain uh, pedo-baptism. Well, what these brothers did was they, they, they left and they started what was called, they didn't call themselves Anabaptists. Their critics called them Anabaptists. Mm -hmm. And the word Anabaptism means to rebaptize. Mm -hmm. And you may not know this, Anthony, but back in 556, 558, uh, the, the emperor Justinian um, implemented an ecclesiastical law for all of Christendom mm -hmm. that basically said that it was a crime to rebaptize, and that whoever rebaptizes is subject to the death penalty. Hmm. 
That was held in the church throughout the Middle Ages. That's why they killed Anabaptists. They burned them at the stake. They drowned them in the, in the rivers to mock their baptism. Mm -hmm. And even Luther supported the attack on the Anabaptists, as did Calvin. And, you know, James White sometimes says that if I was in Geneva in the time of Calvin, he would have run me out of the city. <laughs> and he would, because if you read Calvin's uh, Institutes, uh, he would even refer to the Anabaptists as, as a heretic movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was because of this idea of uh, rebaptism is, is against church canon law. Uh, and so it is from these people, uh, the Anabaptist movement that created the Mennonites and, and other groups. It was uh, from these people that, uh, sorry, Tony, I just got to turn this, uh, sure. I just uh, noticed here, just give me a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was from these, it was from these groups that the, the, the Anabaptist movement spread across Europe and then it went into England. And it's from England that you have the particular Baptists, uh, those who become the, this reform type out of which Charles Spurgeon would later come out of, and, and John Owen and others. Uh, sorry, Owen was a pedo Baptist. Um, and so it was these Anabaptist thinkers who said, the church and the state need a divorce. Mm -hmm. You cannot have the church in bed with the state because these are two different kingdoms. Two cities are, are in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And so it is from these, these brethren, these, these pioneers, that we owe our our rights as Baptists because they, they paid their, they paid with their blood. Um, and they, they are the ones who forged this movement of the Puritans that came to America and established this idea of freedom, freedom of religion, freedom to enjoy liberty, God given innate rights that are inalienable, that cannot be taken away from you. These all came from these Puritan, um, Anabaptist thinkers, and we owe them a great debt. We would sure. not know the United States as we know it today, at least in its foundations, if it was not for these great uh, Anabaptist uh, pioneers. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, um, how, where should we draw the line as far as uh, breaking bread and fellowship with people with regards to baptism? I mean, how far can we, how, what lines can we cross and what lines can't we cross? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that fellowship with, uh, I think our Presbyterian brothers, I mean, if R.C. Sproul was alive, uh, you know, th there's no doubt that I would have no problem breaking bread with him. <laughs> I know John MacArthur did many times. Yeah. Uh, they were dear friends. Um, and I think that, you know, we're back to that again, those fundamentals and, and, and the fundamentals unity. Um, where I would divide is when you come to cases like Roman Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox Church. That's why if I ever go to a wedding or a funeral at these places, I don't partake of communion mm -hmm. uh, because we're not, we're not, we're at two different tables here. We're not thinking the same way. And also because I can't fellowship with someone who believes that they're saved by their works, that they're saved by the sacraments. Uh, Presbyterians don't believe that. Uh, even Lutherans, even though they talk about this, baptismal regeneration, Lutherans are very adamant, at least the Missouri Synod. Remember, Anthony, there's, there's the, mm -hmm. there's the uh, was it the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which I call everything Luther can't affirm. And, <laughs> and, and then there's the Missouri Synod, which is more of the conservative, uh, conservative Orthodox mm -hmm. uh, branch of the church. So I've had fellowship. I've had communion with Lutheran brethren. Um, I've worked, one of my great teachers, mentors who taught me about Islam was a Lutheran minister himself who had a great mission work in India for 25 years. He worked as a missionary, mm. um, great man of God, loved the Lord, uh, understood God's grace that it was a, a, that we can never be saved by anything we did, but still they hold to this wacky idea of baptism regeneration, which I can never understand. But I don't think that's, that's enough to bar us from, from breaking bread with, with Lutherans. Mm. Uh, unless we're talking about the apostate uh, Lutheran church. So would you say, is there any one early church father that stands out as a proponent of believers baptism? Yeah, I think, I think that if we, uh, if we look at um, people like Athanasius, um, not that Athanasius would be against baptizing children, um, but he would also be a, a champion of believers baptism. In the case of children, again, 
when when they approach death, there was the sense of we should get them baptized before they die. Mm -hmm. uh, if you read um, Justin Martyr, Justin Martyr seems to have been someone mm -hmm. who understood believer's baptism. That's about second of the of the second middle of the second century, one fifty A.D. Mm -hmm. um, if you read the Didache, the Didache, which sure. is about 112 AD, very early, it's a worship manual that means the teaching. And in there, it talks about uh, those who receive baptism must first be taught. So they talk about a catechism to teach those. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they can't refer to children because ch little babies rather cannot learn. <laughs> uh, and then it talks about how to baptize them. They should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and it should be in running water preferably mm -hmm. and if not then in still water uh by immersion but to baptize them three times to dump them three times mm -hmm. but the didache doesn't talk about baptism of, of infants it talks about people being taught and then right. being baptized and also in the early church tony uh the the baptism is usually reserved for easter or pentecost so there mm -hmm. was always this you know delay there wasn't this okay we're gonna get you baptized right away it was this, okay, uh, we're at Christmas now, we'll get you baptized on Easter. And then if between Easter and Pentecost, they'll get baptized on Pentecost. So you don't see this urgency, urgency, urgency. We've got to get them baptized. Gotta, they're going to die without baptism. You don't see that. Right. Not until you get to Augustine. Um, and, and so when we look at the, these early fathers, and Tertullian, around 200 AD, Tertullian writes, he's one of the first Latin fathers, he writes and he says that there's this, there's this strange practice that is going on where people are baptizing their children. And then he says, why do they do something which the Lord nor his apostles ever commanded? Now, why would Tertullian say that in the year sure. 1800, the turn of the, the beginning of the third century? Why would Tertullian say something like they're doing something the Lord and his apostles never commanded? And then he says, do they not realize that in baptizing their children, they will rise, they will grow up, and then curse Christ. Mm. Because the idea is they're not regenerate. Right. Right. Yeah, look, if, if baptismal regeneration was true and a scriptural truth, we'd be baptizing everybody we know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, just could talk them into getting baptized. Hey, look, just as a precaution, get baptized. Yeah. If that's where salvation takes place, let's just baptize everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? So is there... Part. Is, is there a, a, a book or a resource that we can point our listeners to that would help us to yeah. understand more about? Yeah, this, this one here, uh, Anthony, uh, Infant Baptism Infant Baptism and Historical Perspective by uh, David F. Wright. This is okay. a very good book. He goes through the history. He mentions a lot of the things I just mentioned as well. Uh, he puts everything into perspective. And uh, he basically, and it's, it's highly endorsed by a, a good number of scholars here in the back. But uh, this is a great book. I would highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's uh, published by, let me just get the publisher here. It's published by Whipton Stock, mm -hmm. uh, Eugene, Ar uh, Eugene uh, Oregon. And uh, the publication date on this one. Let me just check. Uh, yeah. 2007. So again, Infant Baptism in Historical Perspective by David Wright. Okay. Uh, and in fact, it was Dr. Haken who highly recommended this book. The uh, oh. Dr. Haken, as you know, church church history professor at Southern Baptist Theological mm -hmm. Seminary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I just want to ask my uh, my brothers over at Hope if there's any questions that they that they have, they they can text me. Uh, I'll be happy to ask Dr. Tony uh, while we have him on the line. I don't want to keep him too much longer unless you you have a little bit more time. Sure, I have a little okay. bit more time. Sure. Okay. Great. 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 So, um, scripturally, we see the command is to repent and be baptized. Right. So now, uh, Presbyterians would also look at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, uh, and say that one of our commands is to teach them and baptize them in the name of the Lord, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So wouldn't, be, wouldn't baptism at that point be part of something that we're commanded to do to them all right, in order to indoctrinate them into the Christian faith. Yeah, well, if, in Matthew 28, 19, if you notice the first thing the Lord says, he doesn't say, go and baptize everyone in the name of the Father, and then teach them. He says, make disciples of all the nations. That's the first command. And the, 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 the idea of making a disciple, what's a disciple? Well, 
the word disciple is the Greek word mathetes. It's where we get the word mathematics from. It's, a, it's a, the idea of discipline. <laughs> and so a disciple, in Hebrew, they were called Talmudim. The Talmudim, the word Talmud, for example, means a book of learning. And so the Talmudim, the disciples, the, the, the learners, that literally means a learner, make learners of all the nations, teach them, make them students of, of, of who I am. Mm-hmm. Make the, the disciples, not of just Israel, but the whole nations. And then he says, baptize them in the name of the Father. Son, and then teach them everything I've commanded you. Uh, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the earth. So the way I put it, Anthony, I don't know if you heard this before. I, I call it the three W's. You win them, you wet them, and you wean them. <laughs> so win, wet, and wean, W-E-A-N, you wean them off the right. note of the word to go into the solid meat of the word. So mm-hmm. again, make disciples of the nations. It's kind of hard to make disciples out of infants who don't have an idea what you're talking about. And so the idea implies that you are making disciples by doing what? By preaching the gospel, sure. by making it known, and then they hear and they believe. And then what do you do? You baptize them, and then they are to be taught. They learn. That's what Christianity is about, is, is growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Um, mm-hmm. Now, if the Lord said, go and baptize people and then teach them, okay, they may have a case. But that's not what it says. Right, right. I was looking for uh, another verse. I know it's in, in Luke. Um, and a- after uh, a paralytic gets healed by Jesus, um, G- Jesus says, now go to the priest and make an offering for your, for your healing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I look at that and I say to uh, my friends who hold to Acts 2.38, you know, baptism, go call upon the name of Jesus. Uh, mm-hmm you know, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved for the remission of your sins. Are they putting the remission of sins after the baptism when it should be before? Well, it sure sounds like it. It sure sounds like it. But you know, you know, Anthony, when they go to Acts 238, I always, I always tell them to continue reading. Go Mm -hmm. to verse 39. Mm -hmm. Because verse 39 says, the promise is unto you and to your children. And then they stop there. They go, there you go. It's for <laughs> us and for our children. Right. Wonderful. And I said, praise the Lord. Read on. What does it say? And to as many as whom the Lord our God shall call. Oh, oh it's based on God's call. Yeah. Election. Yes. And so it doesn't say the promises to us and to our children. Stop. Full stop. No. Mm-hmm. The promises to you and to your children and to all those who are far off, as many as whom the Lord our God shall call. So the the qualifying clause in that verse there, Anthony, is those whom the Lord our God calls. Does God call everybody? No. Right. And so it's all based on God's election. It's based on his call. And that's one place I always tell my Presbyterian brethren, you know, guys, you know, you're really big on exegesis, but for some reason... You, you, you're not doing justice. You're only reading half that verse. You've got to keep on going yeah. and to get the full context there. Yeah, and I think it's just a reminder to all of us that somewhere along the lines, every single one of us has a blind spot in Definitely. our theology. I mean, the only, the only one who had perfect theology, whoever walked the face of the earth is yeah. Jesus. So right. I, I think it's, it's a reminder to us that we yes. have to be graceful to other people, yes. even though they hold differing positions because – we somewhere along the lines are holding a, an, an error, you know, in our theology. We just don't see it. Right, right. So, we, so we, we do have the noetic effects of the fall, right, Anthony? Yes. We have the noetic effects of the fall, which means that even our, our, our thinking is, is, is filtered through our fallenness. Right. And that is why we need the illumination of the Holy Spirit to make known the Word of God to us. Right. Because it's very easy for us to, again... This is the whole problem with the whole open theist view and the whole problem of, you know, that whole debate we had in the Reform, Reform Baptist circles on the passibility of God. Mm. And we start thinking of, we start defining God through our, our, our faculty. And we've got to be very careful there because right. um, the way we, we think, the way we, 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 we judge things is always filtered through a fallen mind. Sure. We just sure. got to be cautious, and that's a good, yeah. a good point. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I think um, the one thing that we all hold in common is sola scriptura. Absolutely. In other words, we recognize that the Bible is the infallible, in- inerrant word of God, and somewhere along the lines, we're going to misinterpret what God says due to 
you know, our fallen nature and our sin stained minds. So if we're going to get something wrong, we should certainly be gracious to someone else who who's getting something wrong exactly. and has that, that blinder. Exactly. Also. exactly. Absolutely. You know? Right. And, and so I think we need to, uh, we need to be gracious. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be patient. You know, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Paul says yes. we must be patient, patient. And, uh, we need to realize that, yeah, you know, we all have blind spots. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why dialogue with other fellow believers in these areas is so essential. Absolutely. Uh, you know what Hebrews 6 says about, it starts off talking about uh, elementary things like the mm -hmm. resurrection of the dead and, mm -hmm. and, and, and washings, baptisms, and so forth. He goes, well, we should be beyond this by now. This is right. just elementary <laughs> stuff. Oh, you know what? When you when you said that, you just triggered something that I I meant to ask you. Uh, when Scripture talks about baptism for the dead, yes, what is what is that pointing to? Yeah, well, it's the one it's the one verse that the Mormon Church has built a colossal empire on, uh, and the world's biggest genealogical library is is in Utah, in 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 uh, the desert of Utah. And as you know, you probably heard of Ancestry dot com and all these groups that say we can trace. We can tell you who your ancestors were. They're, they're owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, wow. I didn't yeah, know it's that. Owned by, yeah, it's owned by the Mormon Church because what they do is they, they can figure out who your ancestors were and they can baptize uh, living Mormons for the dead. They can baptize a living Mormon on behalf of a deceased person. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they baptized, you know, the founding fathers like George Washington and, and Jefferson and, and John Adams. All these guys have been baptized by Mormons, like by proxy. Mm -hmm. Living members being baptized for Washington. So in the resurrection, all the U.S. presidents are going to be Mormons to the great surprise. But <laughs> in, in the terms of baptism for the dead, Tony, it only appears in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. Right. It appears in a, in a passage of scripture where Paul is dealing with the resurrection. And he's also dealing with people in the church of Corinth who are questioning the resurrection. And, they're, and he's saying, look, if, if the dead do not rise, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then we are all, uh, we're lost. We're mm -hmm. fools. The dead, the dead are lost as well. So what Paul does there, Anthony, is some weird practice emerged in Corinth where they felt that Christians who had died without baptism, they felt that in order to uh, have those Christians uh, be baptized, they came up with some weird idea that uh, living members could be baptized on behalf of the dead. But what Paul does is he doesn't endorse this practice. He mm -hmm. doesn't say, hey, keep it up. Um, he uses it as an argument against them. So what he says is this, look, if you guys say there's no resurrection from the dead, you deny the bodily resurrection. Because a lot of Greeks had a problem with bodily resurrection. He's saying, look, if there is no resurrection from the dead, then why do you baptize for the dead if they are not raised? Right. In other words, he's using it as a polemic. It's a polemical device where Paul is showing how silly they are by doing something which they which goes against their convictions that there's no resurrection. Right. If there's no resurrection, then why do you baptize, why baptize them, them in the first place? So yeah. you'll notice Paul never endorses this. Uh, from what we know, no other New Testament passage other than that one mentions it. The early church has no uh, no evidence that this was ever practiced. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, in 1827, some weird guy in upstate New York, Joel Smith, John Joseph Smith, claims that some angel appeared to him and told him to, to find these golden plates up in the Hill Camorra, up in upstate New York. And, right. and from there you get the Mormon church and they come up with this weird idea. Uh, in Mormon temples, they, they baptize living Mormons on behalf of dead people, mm. uh, which is very weird. But they base mm. it all on 1 Corinthians 15, 29, which Paul never endorsed and which Paul simply exposes as a fraudulent practice. Well, brother, I can't thank you enough for uh, having this conversation with me. I truly appreciate you and your uh, your diligence and the efforts that you put forth, uh, being the apologist that you are and availing yourself to us and making yourself available. You're truly a, a gift to the body, and we very much thank appreciate you, you. I appreciate that too, Anthony, and I appreciate the work you're doing as well with New York Apologetics and thank you. and your your commitment to the to Hope Church. And mm -hmm. uh, please give my love and regard to the brethren there and, and Pastor Jensen and. Uh, God willing, when if this pandemic ever <laughs> uh, uh, ever goes, I, I'd love to come down and and meet you, as Paul says, face to face, and not Amen. by letter. 
Amen. Well, we look forward to that also. So, well, friends, thanks again for joining us on the Reform Rookie Video Podcast. Uh, I'm going to put links to some of the things that Dr. Tony talked about. In fact, that book, I'll get the link to that and some of his other talks uh, with regards to East, Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, remember to look us up on the web at www.reformedrookie.com. You could also check out our YouTube channel. We have over 150 different videos on there uh, hitting reform theology from many different aspects. Uh, we have uh, a podcast also uh, where Pastor Chris is going through the book of Leviticus uh, chapter by chapter, doing a terrific job. Uh, also, Pastor Jensen is going through Spiritual Depression, a book by Martin Lloyd-Jones. That's also on the YouTube channel uh, and available at the podcast. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, and remember, Semper Reformanda.